Hello and welcome to the fifth uh, installment of our uh, podcast, Hicksund, which is a podcast on politics around the world uh, that we examine mostly from the perspective of comparative politics and political theory, but also with insights from uh, other subfields of political science like international relations or American government. Um, uh, today, uh, as usual, um, we will have two subjects uh, one uh, a larger one, a broader one, and uh, a more concise uh, one. Um, and uh, also, as usual, you will have further links to the to the sources that um, uh, you can um, uh, follow up on to learn more about this, these topics. Uh, these links will be posted on the on the Hickson blog, but uh, the blog is linked uh, in the box uh, below this video on YouTube. Uh, so. Uh, the first topic uh, today uh, that we will deal with today is um, the situation of um, uh, the Uyghur population in China, uh, or um, uh, the relationship uh, that, that um, is taking place uh, today between uh, the Chinese uh, People's Republic and its Uyghur population. Uh, and the second uh, topic, the shorter one, we'll deal with, uh, we'll call it Understanding Russia. And uh, I'm going to tell you more when you get there. So why deal with this uh, uh, weirdly named uh, population? Okay, Uyghurs. What are these? Who are these people? Why should we care? Well, I think I think um, that many of you might have seen the following uh, 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 images uh, that I will uh, show you in a second. Um, so probably many of you have seen this image. And if you can't tell what is happening, I'm going to show you another one. Which is quite a shocking, um, quite a shocking image. What you see are detainees who are blindfolded. Uh, their legs are chained. Uh, they're all dressed alike. They're all, uh, um, uh, their hair is cut, uh, you know, zero. Uh, to zero, uh, and they're sitting on the ground in what looks to be, a, in other pictures, uh, it becomes more clear, a train station, and they are heavily guarded, no matter of them being, you know, chained, the uh, hands and feet, and being blindfolded and being set down so they don't know where they are. They are heavily guarded, almost, uh, you know, a guard to every two prisoner, perhaps. Uh, quite a shocking image. Well, who are these? These are the Uyghurs. Uh, and the way they have uh, uh, come into the attention of the world public in the last uh, few years has been by these images and these stories about these re-education camps that the Chinese have built in the last few years, the Chinese government has built uh, in the last few years, a uh, re-education camp uh, that um, uh, uh, where seemingly, according to information, almost 1 million uh, Uyghurs are uh, being uh, held. Now, um, what, uh, what is the context? Who are these Uyghurs and why should, well, now we know why should we care about this because this is a, quite a shocking uh, image. And, and the question arises, why this situation? Why are, why are suddenly we, have, we hear about this um, re-education, labor, whatever you want to call them, camps, Concentrate, um, yeah, uh, re-education camps probably is the best name, uh, <clears throat> where ob over a million or probably about a million people are being held. So why should we care about this? Uh, or what is the reason behind this threat? Uh, what is the context that led to this and why now? So for that, let's look a little bit at, at, at this uh, at China, the People's Republic of China. Now, I usually tell my students, uh, whenever you see a large country, you can assume that uh, it will have many ethnic uh, and religious, different ethnic and religious groups. The, the larger the country, the, the, the more, uh, the larger the number of those ethnic groups you can assume. And that's true, because as we have discussed in previous uh, installments of this podcast, and people who have heard me talk about this have heard me say a lot of times that, you know, identity has never been formed across history along the border lines of today's states, yeah? So an identity normally, organically, is formed uh, locally, right? So um, uh, think about how far a person can walk, uh, can go uh, within a lifetime. If, you know, normally, what is your area of, of um, 
that is your strictly speaking home right and and also across history what would be that so it would be a basically uh, i don't know maybe 100 miles uh, 200 miles i mean how much more can you know oh, that's a lot actually probably 50 miles because how much more can you really know that is yours right that that belongs to you and um uh and and that's kind of how how uh, across history you know identity really was was uh, was formed uh, hence the, the existence of many languages, dialects, ethnic groups, tribes, and so on. Because we don't live in this gigantic... Now we have a knowledge of, of, of the world, right? Of, of humankind and of the globe. But that's... that's um, uh, and, and as we started knowing about this, we also started developing these concepts of humankind uh, and what it means, right? Uh, but, but in terms of what we associate ourselves with, right? That is a that is a much smaller population now. Since the nineteenth century, with the advent of the modern state, and what modern state that also claims to be a nation state, the modern state also kind of inculcated in their population, in their citizenship, the idea. They basically taught them that you know it's this these political borders are actually also the borders of your identity. That's that's not true. You know, effectively, it's not true. Because again, you probably will not even get to know all that, and that's not your natural habitat let me put it that way within which you live but but you're taught to associate with that it's sort of a, a top-down not a bottom-up sort of the um, construction of identity right uh, be it by saying the pledge of allegiance in the morning at the, an american school or, or learning history in uh, i don't know poland uh, where you're told that okay this is poland and then all of poland is one thing and they're all polish and so on well again that's not how identity has been built so, hence the idea that, that the larger the country, the more such such uh, uh, ethnic groups uh, will be necessarily present, uh, or different religious groups or language groups will be necessarily present, and also that's also obviously then true of China. China is a highly diverse uh, ethnically and religiously, although religious religion is oppressed, but ethnically, religiously, linguistically diverse uh, country. Uh, and just to exemplify that and to show that, I'm going to show you uh, an ethnic ethno-linguistic map of China, uh, right? Because again, ethnicity, how you define ethnicity, that's, uh, uh, you know, you can define it by different criteria, uh, but language usually is a good way of defining an ethnic group, but uh, you can have different ethnic groups speaking the same language, whatever. But that's a good way. And in China, you can see that the Han, which is the majority population, which is this this sort of brown, this is darker brown, uh, kind of like from my, my shirt, I think, um, that's the Han population. That's the majority population in China. That's what we typically associate with Chinese, right? Uh, but then there are many other uh, kinds of population. You have uh, the Hui, who are uh, Muslims, Chinese Muslims, but Han, well, probably Han-related Muslims. Uh, you have the Tibeto um, uh, Burman ethnicities. Um, you have Thai. You have Miao uh, Yao, and uh, Tajik and uh, Khmer and uh, Korean here, obviously, right? Again, because borders don't correspond with, with the spread of ethnic groups. And what interests us, uh, Turkic populations, so not Turkish, but Turkic, right? Uh, from, from that uh, sort of stock of, of ethnicities, um, which include uh, Kazakhs and um, uh, and other Turkic groups and Uyghurs, and these Turkic populations um, that include the Uyghurs live um, in uh, in the northwest part of uh, China. Let me show you another. Oops, let me show you another ethnic map. Here it is, and uh, here they live here um, in what, in administratively, is called the Xinjiang. Uyghur Autonomous Region. Yeah, the name also tells you that this has to do with, has to do with a specific um, ethno-cultural group, just like the Tibet Autonomous, Autonomous Region has to do with another um, uh, uh, ethno-cultural group and, and so on. So that is the context. So here are the Uyghurs. As you see, it's a huge territory. A large part of this huge country is China, but uh, proportional-wise, in terms of the size of the population, this is not a large uh, proportion of the population of China, pro uh, uh, of the Chinese uh, Republic of China, uh, which, as we know, is one of the uh, largest uh, uh, countries on Earth with more than uh, a billion people. 
um, and of which 92% are Han, and there are about 55 recognized, 55 recognized ethnic minorities, uh, their size ranging from thousands to millions. And the Uyghurs are about 10 million. And that already should, should stop us in our tracks because we just said, we just talked about the fact that there, there, there should be, there probably are about a million Uyghurs in these re-education camps. Now that's one in 10, if not more, actually with, with, large, with a huge also out emigration of the Uyghurs. That is a huge proportion of the population, one in 10 Uyghurs in, in a re-education camp. That should stop us in our tracks and ask ourselves and, and, and ask um, make us ask ourselves what's what's going on here. Um, so as I said, and but this region, the Uyghur Autonomous Region, although it's called Uyghur, it actually has um, the Uyghurs are mostly on on the southern part. I think it's around here, uh, and in the other parts are basically half of the population. And there's other Turkic people there, like the Kazakhs and the Kyrgyz, but there's also Han people. As we'll see, mostly as, as a result of forced sort of uh, colonization from the from the Chinese government movement of Han people from the center of China to to this uh, uh, region, uh, and and many other ethnic groups as well. Um, so let me. So who are these Uyghurs again? Let's. Okay, we talked about the fact that they are Turkic. They're also Muslim, and that's also an important thing, an important specific difference. And they also, uh, uh, physio uh, in terms of uh, physiognomy, um, uh, and that, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, visual attributes, they do not look like we as what was associated with Chinese. So here's a few pictorials. Again, all of these resources uh, will be linked in the um, in the blog. Uh, here are some um, pictorials of of Uyghurs. Um, and as you look at them, you would think that these are pictures from uh, probably Turkmenistan of Kyrgyzstan and so on. Indeed, because these are, as I said, it's a Turkic population closer uh, in, in uh, you know um, culture uh, uh, to obviously to the their Turkic uh, brethren. Uh, and as I said, images like this you would see in uh, pictures from Tur Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kazakhstan, and so on. Um, so, and uh, this is a powerful um, image of um, some Uyghurs uh, and also Chinese uh, soldiers or military police uh, moving into the region. Um, there you go. And uh, there's also another pictorial that I'm going to let you uh, study that shows, uh, um, again, Uyghurs and not just the uh, rural Uyghurs, but Uyghurs that also uh, highly educated urban Uyghurs and, and so on. I'm not going to go into detail there. Uh, so, um, that uh, that being said, so let's, now you have perhaps a, a picture of what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, so what is the history of the, of the Uyghurs' presence uh, uh, there? Um, well, uh, that region even uh, basically has not been really incorporated within China until uh, the advent of communist China. So it was mostly like a like a colony of China in the 19th century or during the during the Qing uh, dynasty, um, <clears throat> a colony that was exploited. Remember, notice also that it's in between uh, China and uh, Russia and has been there. So that's a, sort of a, also. Uh, sort of at the crossroads of, of empires and disputed therefore um, and uh, so only after uh, the communist power and formed the people's republic of china has the integration uh, or, or of this region into uh, the china republic of china uh, really uh, began and what we will see over during our discussion uh, is that um, uh, both the attempt to integrate them um, uh, in the state, so the state building part, and into the Chinese nation, whatever that might mean, uh, have failed. So back to our back to our original sort of starting point of why are there a million Uyghurs in the education camps and why are they being reeducated and uh, and I'm going to tell you about other ways in which they are uh, oppressed. Really, um, there's a you know China is a sort of a totalitarian state, perhaps that no were as true as in uh, this uh, Uyghur autonomous uh, region. Um, so, um, 
so the, back to the question of why is this the situation and why do they need to be reeducated? What's the cause of this human tragedy that is happening there? Um, and I will propose a threefold explanation or a threefold sort of uh, uh, threefold sources of the of the of the conflict. Uh, one is uh, ethnic, uh, national, and has to do with nation building and state building. Uh, the second one has to do with religion uh, versus uh, official, basically atheism, uh, but also uh, religion in the in the context of the rise of Islamism. And the second, the third uh, reason is uh, obviously um, the nature of the communist regime, uh, and and it's uh, which is inherently totalitarian and wants to control everything and to subordinate every. Uh, Entire the entirety of one's life under under that ideology, so it's nationalism, uh, it's really uh, 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 religion versus uh, or the religious component, the religion component, and third the uh, communist uh, dimension, the communist. These are the three reasons, three three lines along which uh, the conflict between the Uyghur population and the because we can call it this a conflict between the Uyghur population and the Chinese uh, state happens. So. As I was saying, um, um, the the integration, if we want to call it, or the attempt to integrate uh, this uh, the Xinjiang uh, autonomous region, has really started after the communists uh, took power in uh, uh, after 1949. Uh, so it's recent this attempt, and it has not succeeded. Uh, not only has it not succeeded, uh, it is. Um, uh, it is still ongoing. It's a, it has been a failure, right? And uh, uh, the reason why it has been a failure has, has to do with all three aspects that I just uh, mentioned. But let's talk a little bit about this uh, this region. As I said, um, uh, it is called the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region uh, from the uh, perspective of the, uh, so to speak, of the occupant. The Uyghur population, however, tends to refer to it as uh, Uyghurstan or Eastern Turkestan, Eastern Turkestan, uh, and the second name Eastern Turkestan uh, goes back to um, a short-lived um, autonomous or quasi-autonomous uh, republic that the Uyghur or the Turkic populations there have established in the 1930s, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which was called Eastern Turkestan, but it was never recognized and it never had the power to, you know, withstand the two empires within which it found itself, the Russian and the Chinese uh, Empire. For all intents and purposes, the Chinese um, uh, People's Republic is an empire, um, just like the Chinese Empire before was an empire. Um, and so, so what is uh, that's that's the um, as I said that is the um, um, so that's that's about the region. How about the population? Uh, as I said, it's a Turkic population, which means that they have a different religion, they have different physiognomy, physical attributes. Uh, they have a different culture. Uh, they have a different religion than the Han population. Let's associate the Han with the sort of the majority of what we kind of uh, identify as Chinese. Uh, they are not Chinese. They are not Chinese. They do not uh, identify themselves as Chinese. As Chinese, it would be hard to even you know, um, uh, uh, to, with the Han, right? With the Han Chinese, right? Because uh, they are very different. They are radically different from linguistic, uh, cultural. Uh, physical, uh, religious, uh, from all the perspectives and um, uh, the perspective of the traditions and customs and how they live and history, and um, so 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 it's a it's a it's a population is clearly distinct, uh, and their incorporation into the into China proper raises questions like what is because what is China? And here we get back to the to what we discussed in terms of. Um, when we talked about uh, Russia, or if anyone talks about Russia in terms of the, the Russian identity, uh, is it an ethnic identity? Is it a state-based identity? Because the borders of Imperial Russia or the Russia that we have today, that are uh, you know that uh, uh, covers most of Asia, yeah, um, or a huge part of Asia, but it covers because that this is this was a result of expansions for several centuries from the European part of Russia eastward, right? Uh, so there's no natural habitat in Asia for Russians, right? So you will have many ethnic groups there as well. So you have the same conflict there between one is, you know, there's the ethnic Russians 
and then there's Russia as belonging to this historical Russian state that they have built, yeah, and where there's many ethnic groups. And and you have to find words. As I said, in Russia they have Rasi, uh, uh, Rasi, and uh, Rasiski. Uh, sort of a, these are the two terms, if I uh, pronounce them correctly. One one it means the ethnic uh, thing, and the other means belonging to the state as such, Rasiski, belonging to the state as such. Um, but whenever you have this sort of conflict, just an informal Yugoslavia, there's also an implicit, that was true in the case of the Soviet Union, it is true in the case of um, uh, communist China right now, you have an implicit also reality, well, a, a, a subtext, so to speak, and there's, a, there's another reality underneath it, and that reality is that the, although they call the entire thing, you know, let's say China, or the entire thing Rasiski, yeah, uh, which means that it's it's sort of uh, accommodating of all and everybody's part of it, yeah? In fact, there is uh, uh, an ethnic group that dominates and in fact, that is the ethnic group to whom the, who really r- runs the country. So that's a, that's, a, that's a huge conflict for the other ethnic groups, right? And for the other ethnic uh, or ethno-national groups uh, because they, on the one hand, they're told you're part of it and on the other hand, you're... you're you know that you're actually a sect. You, this is not your country because the the levers of power belong to the to the majority population, and that's true in China as well. And as um, so, what we have, and as, as I said, there's three sort of lines of uh, conflict uh, or uh, zones of conflict or, or sources of conflict that has have led to the current situation of the Uyghurs in China. And one, as I said, is the nation building part. And here, just in the case of Russia and Ukraine, it's a nation building on both sides. Because, again, um, the, the, the whole idea of the nation state is a very recent one, and it's a construct. Um, and uh, so, so China has, has, been, has had to, to, to struggle with it um, in modernity, like any other country, especially a, a country that has been an empire and kind of has retained the borders of empire uh, in terms of size. and um, uh, and even in, increase them because under communism, even increased the, the 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 importance of those borders because under communism everything is centralized, and the communist party wants to control the entirety of the territory. Under an empire, you can be looser with the control. Under communism, you can't. You have to control the entirety of the of the territory and also of the population. So here, the uh, this is why uh, um, in a communist state, it's very important that every part of the population is integrated into the whole. Because you need inherently, because of the communist idea, to control the entirety of the population. So inherently, so there will be this clash. And, and interesting enough, inherently the national question becomes prominent and you have to deal with it. But you have to deal with it in, in the sense of inventing terms and trying to make sense of it. Uh, because these ter- again, the modern nation state is a construct, is an invention um, that is built on pre-existing realities, that, but not that does not correspond with the, with the results that we see today in terms of the borders of the states. This is why, well, since being a construct, you have you, uh, a fairly recent one, you have to invent the words to describe. Yeah? So, hence, for example, in France, uh, everybody after the French Revolution, everybody who, in the middle of the French Revolution, rather, um, when the, at the height of the ideals of uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, right, the freedom, equality, fraternity, there was this idea that anyone who subscribes to this idea is French, because that's what makes us French. Because uh, again, the local identities are different than the dialect. So what is this France and what is the France for? When the revolution took over the state and said, this is a state of liberté, égalité, fraternité. Hence, anyone who subscribes to these ideas of liberté, égalité, fraternité can come here, because this is the state of those who believe in this. Just like America, United States. Of America was was founded on on paper at least on this idea of um, uh, that are explained in the Declaration of Independence and the idea is that well I guess you know this is what makes you American uh, so basically anyone could become a American if you subscribe to these ideas well that's what the French tried there but you know obviously they realized that that's not gonna, that's not very practical to just say to anyone from around the globe if you believe in these ideals you can come and you're French because Clearly, there's more to that. Um, so they have struggled with that. And then uh, as a result of the wars that uh, uh, they entered with the neighbors uh, during the revolution, they, they, it became very clear that only those within these borders 
uh, are French, but what makes them French? And then they imposed a common language on them, and they taught them there's one history, and blah, blah, blah. And those who opposed this were eliminated, like the Vendée uh, population. Uh, so the same in China. So what I'm saying is that I'm giving examples that this is not just a Chinese problem. Uh, the, the process of nation uh, state building, no, it's something that, you know, we got to the a world of states, meaning a world that, you know, if you click on the map of the world, you see patches of different colors co covering the entirety of the inhabitable uh, surface of, of the earth. Now, that never was the case. So, for example, if you go to um, um, uh, maps, older maps of the world, you will notice that... Um, uh, uh, the uh, there's many white spots, yeah, and that's not white spots because nobody lives there because people live everywhere. Uh, it's because uh, it, the world was not covered by states. The the inhabitable world was not assigned to states, not all of it. But now we live in a world in which there's no basically there's uh, no inhabitable part of Earth that or, that has not been assigned to a state. That has never been the case, and, and it has be and it doesn't have to be this way either. Yeah, it has been this way because this model of the modern state has, has become very successful and it's very hard to compete with it if you're not a state, as the Native Americans from North America have discovered, uh, that if you're not organized into a state, you don't have the tools to resist states that come to colonize. And when they realized that was too late. But in India, Gandhi realized this and so he created... Uh, he, he did nation and state building that managed to kick the British out uh, uh, by taking the model of the state. What I'm saying is that the model of the state has become universal, but has become universal very, very recently. Um, because again, people don't need to live within a state as we understand it today. They can live in live nice in a tribe or, or a village or whatever, and it's not a state. Anywho. Um, so China is not a, a, an outlier. This is a process is that all the countries need to go through, and the current war in, in Russia is just happening because of the same, the same darn things. Um, so so let's um, so that's that's what I'm trying to say that it's the same process, um, and um, uh, that that has happened elsewhere. Process of nation and state building. But it really came into its own, this process, after the communist state took power, because before that you didn't really have a Chinese state to speak of. You had warlords, and you had the two factions, the nationalists and the communists, fighting each other for control of this, again, fragmented, not quite state that was the China, Chinese region, the Middle Kingdom, yeah. But then they formed a, 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 a state, and by virtue of the ideology of communism, it, uh, once they took control of the state, they also tried to control uh, truly, the entirety of the territory and the population that makes up the state. And this is when they can also really engage into the process of, of nation and state building and say, okay, this is what it means to be Chinese and this is what it means to be, uh, well, this is what China is, yeah? Uh, it was much more fl fluid before because you never had like a, a stable, this is it, an immutable thing. Um, and um, uh, this is also when inherently they also... Uh, awakened uh, the, the national consciousness, uh, well, national consciousness, as if there's dormant national consciousnesses uh, lying around. No, they also forced the other uh, ethnic groups to develop such um, national identity. Uh, because remember, the modern state is a weird state because of this idea of democracy and the idea of a pe one people should control a state and their own state because then once you apply this model, then you say, well, which people and what makes them one people and who among this population that speaks different words is that people? And are they part of the people or, or, or not? And if they're not, what are they doing here on our land, right? Um, but once you start developing this national consciousness on a territory uh, and you claim it for yourself, the one other, one, other ethnic groups who live there uh, inherently will be excluded. And so their only weapon to fight this is to themselves claim a nation for themselves and claim that, no, no, we too are a nation and uh, hence we too deserve to have a state. So you cannot uh, either erase us or dissolve us uh, into your own self. Uh, nationalism, this is the, the process of nationalism uh, where nation building uh, creates nation building and nationalism produces uh, engenders nationalism. It's, it's a very interesting thing, as I was talking in the previous episode, that 
there has been no more powerful nation building uh, uh, factor uh, probably in the history of Ukraine than the current war in Ukraine. Um, so that's what happened. So while this was going on in in uh, in, um, in China proper, but also in then in communist China, it also um, awakened this uh, national consciousness. Like awakening, it's a wrong term because there's no such consciousness sleeping and then it, it awakens. There's no this identity is not like lingering and then suddenly it, it pops up. No, it's constructed uh, in the sense of national identity, not ethnic identity. That exists. Because we know we speak the same language, have the same habit, uh, habits, we're kind of similar, yeah. But to be a nation is something else. Is to claim that you're separate from the others, and also you need to have your own state. So as China was building a nationhood and statehood, uh, as it met with other uh, ethnic groups on its territory, it forced them to claim nationhood and statehood. So um, and this has happened since the 19th century, but really accentuated in the during communism. So that also happened in the Uyghur, uh, uh, with the Uyghurs, because they have, there has been, you know, seemingly, historically, there, there was a, a, an Uyghur uh, uh, kingdom or empire somewhere um, in, um, uh, in history. Um, let's see if I have it, because um, I don't want to sound too vague, because it sounds dismissive. I think, yeah, uh, around the 8th, 9th century, um, <clears throat> seemingly. And then, but it didn't last long. And then uh, there was some population movement. But the um, the name Uyghur, and this is interesting, um, it kind of faded in history. It was not used, it was not um, uh, employed until um, the 15th century, but really picks up in the... 19th, 20th century for the same reasons, right? So an, an example from the from Europe is uh, Slovenia, Slovenians, yeah, who uh, you know never had a statehood in history, and when with the when uh, you had the fall of the uh, crumbling of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so, uh, which fall was uh, caused in a large degree by different ethnic groups uh, claiming nationhood and then claiming their own statehood. They suddenly were forced to become a nation and to claim nation as something they want to like. What do I bother? Because <laughs> again, this you don't have to be this. It doesn't mean that you don't exist. But to claim nation means that you need to have your own state with separate. And why not live nicely as we have lived with the Bavarians before? And and you know the fact that we speak different languages, we can all speak each other's language uh, at a certain point in administration or, uh, or Latin or whatever. So why should we have different states, our own state? Why why bother? Because norm that's not a necessity for existence. It's just this is a modern the modern paradigm of the nation state says that no, no you have to be. Why? Is that a guarantee of a, of, of a good life of, of paradise on earth? Clearly, it's not. We know from experience, um, and definitely having just one nation in one state is not the the the, the um, uh, so uh, recipe for so for happiness. Of course, it it, it can be. Um, a recipe for unhappiness if this is the paradigm and you happen to be of a different ethnic group, in which case, again, you're forced to claim nationhood. So so we have this process in which we are, they are forced, you know, all these ethnic groups, if you don't want to be a loser or dissolved or sort of persecuted, because in a, in a, in a world of nation states, persecution is inherent. Uh, because if we say that one state is one nation, it means that those who don't belong to the nation, they don't have any part in owning this state. This is why it's a, it's a wrong concept. It's essentially wrong. Uh, because the world is not divided into nation, neatly, geographically, and so on. And you always have populations speaking other languages. So what do you do with them? Are they second class and so on? And we're still start struggling to uh, figure out, even in the United States, where it's basically, well, come who, whoever wants to come and they learn English. Well, there, is a na there are nations, as you well know, who have a sort, a sort of limited form of sovereignty, and they are uh, the, the re remainings, the remains, yeah, of the previous um, uh, native populations, right? And they have reservations, reserved spaces that where they have limited sovereignty, and they're called nations now. Why do we call them nations? They never call themselves nations because of the paradigm. So you see what a weird thing we invented to kind of make up for this, the fact that we had to 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 do ethnic cleansing here on this continent to to claim it for the um, for the Europeans. Um, so, 
so you have a, 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 a as I said, <coughs> the so so you have two simultaneous processes happening: the Chinese <coughs> a nation building process and state building process, uh, inherently clashing with the other um, um, ethnic groups there in the in the region. Especially because it was a totalitarian system. In a democracy, you can find accommodation. The northern, the Scandinavian states are good examples where you have indigenous populations like the Sami, um, or or populations from a from not the, of a different ethnicity, um, uh, uh, like the uh, what is it, the Swedish in Finland, I think, uh, who are who have their own uh, limited autonomy within the state, so they're accommodated. In democracy, you kind of it's easier. But in a totalitarian state, it's very hard because you have to, to, to control everything. Um, so that's the root of the of the one of the roots of the problem. That this is a population that does not want to be dissolved and cannot be dissolved because they can't become something that they're not. Now, of course, what the Chinese uh, government can do is to is to and, and it has been tried. It has been trying to 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 dissolve them, to control them. Um, but they tried in various ways. They tried to accommodate them, but uh, then uh, once you accommodate them, they want, inherently they do want uh, self-governance, which for a communist state especially doesn't work. Plus, uh, you know, China is highly nationalistic, actually, um, <clears throat> and, and doesn't want to acknowledge the existence of rival you know, nations on its territory. So that's one of the reasons why, uh, so they tried to accommodate it, and then they have moved to, to oppression. And how they oppress them is by basically trying to attack every single element of their identity. As I said, uh, some things you can change, like physiognomy and so on, but uh, you can force them to, you can uh, punish them, you can ban every uh, any um, uh, book or writing about uh, Uyghur history and so on, right? Because, you know, when you develop your own, um, when you claim nationhood, you do it by creating narratives. Uh, and those narratives usually are historical because they say there has been an Uyghur population that goes back in history and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and that's how you claim that you exist. Hence all these uh, maniacal obsessions with who was where first, right? Because you want to claim history as your own um, and exclusive. So, so or, by, uh, or by forcing them to speak uh, uh, Mandarin and uh, not Uyghur and, and, uh, and to clamp, clash down clamp down on the other uh, aspect of uh, their identity, which is religion and so on. But um, before we go into the various ways in which oppression has happened and this attempt at dealing with, with this population that doesn't want to integrate, um, let me, uh, we talked about the fact that the Chinese have had to work out some concepts um, to, to make sense of the fact that we are an empire for all intents and purposes, a multi-ethnic state, and yet uh, we we should all be Chinese because it's called China, but let's not you know uh, so. But there's a dominant Han population, ninety two percent. But but we as communists, we you know the party of the people. We can't say that the China is only belongs to the Han. So we can say we should say that it belongs to everyone. So China should mean something else than Han. So so how do they deal with this? Well, uh, as I said, you deal with it by by defining terms. Yeah, like Rasi. And Rasiski, whatever, uh, and and the term that they have used is Minzu, <clears throat> and Minzu is um, a term that uh, kind of means nation, but uh, uh, but it led to, to <laughs> it led to many uh, it led to many problems um, because um, basically they used Minzu to refer both to the China. At large, China proper in terms of the entire population of China, and to refer to the ethnocultural uh, groups within. But that was a trap because once you refer to them with the same word that you refer to as the big population, meaning the people of China are a minzu, a nation, but also the ethnocultural groups within it are a minzu, you also inherently give them the right to say, well, we, then we too are a nation and then we need our own state. Uh, so, so they have said, so they have been trying to. Um, uh, manipulate a little bit the terms and to uh, create it um, uh, uh, to clarify to refine these terms. So there's now then then they came up with this a more uh, 
all-encompassing uh, category called uh, Zhongkua Minzu, like the Chinese nation as a whole, which includes other Minzu, uh, like the Han, Uyghur, and whatever. So Han being one Minzu among many. Now, this is the Rasiski versus Rasi, right? So Rasiski being all the population of the Russia, Russian state, Rasia, uh, Rasi, uh, or whatever, something like that, is a Russian ethnic Russian. And then you have Chechen and Gagos and whatever other uh, uh, ethnic groups, yeah? And they're all different ethnic groups within uh, Russia. Uh, and they're all Rasiski, but they're not Rasi. Um because they're Chechen or whatever. And this is this was the this was the but as I said, the reality, the reality of the fact is that that's not how things work. That's not how things work, uh, especially in non-democratic countries, because the, the largest ethnic group effectively is associated with the state, and that's the Han. So the Han is actually the Chinese in in for in terms of purposes and in terms of their domination. Uh, and the Han is the, the sort of the tool that, that the state uses to, to dominate the other ethnic groups. So how can you say that the Han is just one Minzu among many? Because clearly Han is kind of the backbone of the of the uh, Zhonghua Minzu, of the, of the Chinese nation as a whole. In fact, Han is the Chinese nation, we can say, for, in, in terms of effective uh, uh, role and power. Han dominates China, the Han. Yeah, the Han Chinese, I'm sure maybe some other groups as well, but the Han especially. But clearly not the Uyghurs, and and this is also why they have been uh, moving pe populations into into the Uyghur autonomous region to uh, uh, to change the balance of the population because as I said, the Uyghurs don't want to be assimilated and the Han uh, are the backbone of the of the of the actual Chinese uh, 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 nation, so they try to to work with this also you know because. Of, Chinese uh, uh, communism, you know, you have this whole idea that you need to, um, um, uh, you need to be, uh, to serve the people, right? And, uh, uh, you know, so at least on paper, it needs to look good. Um, so, more recently, um, they have moved away from using Minzu to mean ethno uh, to refer to the ethno cultural groups because Minzu means nation. <laughs> and as I said, once you allow them to call themselves nation, they can claim they can claim statehood. Um, so so now Minzu is only used for the idea of Chinese nation, and then they have recently invented another word to refer to ethno cultural groups to what we call ethno cultural groups. And so we have one Chinese nation that has many ethno cultural groups. That's now the, the rhetoric. But the fact is not that. The fact is not that. Um, and, and as I said, uh, as this is part of the Chinese process of, of nation building, right? Of, because a lot of nation building has to do with what? Writing history, claiming territory through that writing of history because you say we are Chinese and this Chinese goes back in his time. And so whatever, whoever lived here, whatever empire was here 2,000 years ago, that was also Chinese. That's not true, of course. Because there were something, but they might not have been Chinese. And uh, but you need to create uh, uh, the idea of this Wuhan, um, um, right? Maybe they were Mongols. Maybe and if you look at the history of China and, and who ruled them and so on, you will see that you had many ethnic groups, different ethnic groups. So you have Muslims there and so on. But anyway, um, and in fact, a lot of the dynasties were not Han. Um, uh, but you know, going back. Um, History writing is a tool of nation building, yeah? Uh, because you say, us here, whoever are now within the state, have already existed as a unified uh, entity. Oh, not true. Um, uh, so China has been doing that, defining concepts, writing, uh, 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 clarifying language, imposing maybe one language or not, depending on the state. And he, uh, but, but that same process is also took place within the Uyghur population, although under oppression. So they wrote, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, through writing dictionaries. That's, that's one of the things that all the nation builders in the 19th century in Europe did. They wrote dictionaries because dictionaries defined what? The language and defined, and then based on that language, you define identity. Uh, define, uh, uh, writing dictionaries, writing histories, the history, legends, putting down the legends on paper because that becomes the legend of us. Um, and there's an us-ness then. Um, and and, the, and our, 
um, and of course, as a result, the Chinese had to to um, uh, to work um, actively uh, to uh, to crush any such attempt um, uh, to to define nationhood, right? So one of the reasons for this oppression and what's happening there, and one of the ways in which um, um, uh, the oppression is is uh, is happening. Is is by clamping down on on uh, the elites, on the literate elites, and on um, artifacts or, 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 or um, written uh, attempts to to define Uyghur identity, uh, right? Because you start you're trying to stop the process of uh, of nation building, and that's how it happens. That's how it happens in the Chinese case. That's how it happens in the Uyghur case. Um, so. Um, And and part of this this uh, claiming of, of a past is also the um, uh, the name of the region. As I said, this is why they refer to the region these two populations, the Han Chinese and the or the official Chinese government and the Uyghurs refer to this region in two different names. Um, one is the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, um, uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region, and the other one which is not Uyghur Autonomous Region because actually those who rule there are Han. Irony, um, and the and the, the Uyghurs themselves refer to the region as Uy uh, Uyghurstan or Near East Turkestan. Um, so, um, okay, so that's the nation. That's one of the sources of the conflict. As I said, it's the fact that you have effectively uh, two processes of nation and state building happening at the same time, uh, one creating the other, or one awakening the other, or whatever. Um, and uh, the the second source of the clash um, is is uh, uh, the religion uh, part. Uh, and obviously, the sources here are twofold. One that religion is uh, inherently a, a distinctive uh, trait of whatever makes makes them Uyghurs, right? The fact that they're, more, that they're Muslim clearly differentiates them from the Han. Uh, then. Um, the fact that, um, <clears throat> and then there's the ideological thing that the communism, the communism religion is, at best, um, sort of acquiesced, or um, uh, you know, um, uh, bared with, you know, but <laughs> definitely not supported or accepted. And the ideal uh, is a, a, an a-religious world and an, an erasing of religion out of the society. An atheist uh, society, like um, uh, an enforced, forcibly atheist uh, society, like like Albania was during communism. Um, and the third dimension here is where we get into complication. Complications is um, uh, the post 9/11 world. And in fact, if you uh, noticed on some of these images, a few of them, you noticed uh, some um, uh, habits of dressing. Uh, for the for the women that that uh, go as far as covering themselves completely, that is not part of the tradition of the Uyghurs. So what are we talking about? Um, uh, the Uyghurs themselves, um, you know, Muslim religion is their religion, but uh, this accentuation of of, of that component of their identity uh, and the uses of that aspect of their identity has changed in the last two or three decades. And I, I'm going to give you an example like what I mean by this. Um, in France, for example, you have the, 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 the famous problem of the banlieue uh, where, you know, the disenfranchised Arab youth uh, you know, are rampaging, and you have uh, riots, and you have problems, and they're not integrated. Uh, and you also have the rise of of uh, uh, radical Islamism, yeah, uh, which is not the same as Islam. Uh, but these are not the same thing. In fact, the Arab populations in 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 uh, France used to be highly secular. Islamism is a religion, and any religion can you know comes and can catch fire in a specific place if it finds the 
the, um, the, the ripe territory, right? And where do you find the ripe territory? In the place where, let's say, you have a population that is disenfranchised or highly unhappy, and the ideology gives them a, an explanation of the causes of their unhappiness and of the way out. That's, what the, that's why Islamism spread in, in, in France. Not Islam, Islamism. Even, even Islam, but Islamism, this extremist ideology, has spread because it came in a situation of disenfranchisement where suddenly it gave them an explanation of, okay, here's why things are things suck, uh, and here's how to get out of it. And Islamism is the, power, the way out of it, and hence, you know, terrorism and whatever. And in a population that was highly secular, by the way, secularized, secularized, uh, not even religious, yeah, that's what I mean. Um, and uh, so you have this phenomenon, and that's what happened also in the uh, uh, East Turkestan, Uyghurstan, Uyghur Autonomous Region, um, uh, because um, the rise of, of Islamism, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, uh, gave them uh, another anchor to, to fight with which to fight or, or, uh, the uh, oppression of, of the, uh, that they suffered from the uh, Chinese government. Um, right? It gives you an ideological backbone to them. Not for all of them, but it, uh, and the more you oppress them, the more you force them to, you know, pick up such, such, such crutches, right? Just like you force them to define themselves as nations, once you claim nationhood and uh, the, the sole right to rule them and, then, uh, and to rule the state within which they find themselves, the same here, uh, you, you force them to give to, to find narratives uh, that would uh, uh, coalesce them and that also would give them tools to defend themselves. And then 9-11 happened, and 9-11 happened, uh, China used 9-11 very, um, the Chinese government, I mean, always by that. Uh, and, uh, they used 9-11 very uh, adeptly, uh, because it, after 9-11, any, <laughs> any militant Muslim could be called an Islamist, yeah? And maybe some of them were, but maybe, probably, surely some of them were not. So they used this, China used this, and kind of used, um, conditioned their support uh, given to the U.S. Uh, war on terror um, by, by uh, sort of forcing the hand of the United States to declare some of these Uyghur independence movements as terrorist movements in, because identifying them with Islamism, which is not necessarily true and doesn't, because uh, uh, again, at the heart of it, this is a nation, it's a conflict of nation building. It's, a, it's, a, it's about nationalism versus nationalism. It's about trying to assimilate a population. That's the heart of the whole thing. Let's be very clear. Uh, but then Islamists also come in. And some of them clearly, uh, you know, some of them were not Islamists, but also you will find some Islamists because they will pick up this as a, as a, as a, as a tool to oppose the, uh, the, the, the ruling ideology. Same in Chechnya, which was highly, highly atheistic and secularized you know, after eight, nine decades in on, in the Soviet Union, and then suddenly Islamism came in, uh, uh, and Islam as well uh, got accentuated, but also Islamism came in, and then it became a, 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 a sort of a tool to strength, strengthen around which to build and strengthen one's identity and to fight the others. Um, and again, Islam is not Islamism. So, so using the post 9 11 uh, uh, world, that's another reason why, um, um, and also the fact that some uh, Islamist movements did develop uh, among the Uyghurs, uh, and and they did uh, re, uh, take re, uh, recourse. You know, the more they were oppressed, the more they responded. You know, for a while it was very quiet there. You know, they have protests in the 90s, in the 80s, 90s, 90s up to 2000 something, and then there was a huge oppression wave from the government. I think after 2008 or something, and then after 2014 this kind of exploded again, uh, even with violence. Um, and in the last few years, you have had some, some, uh, some uh, really uh, violent uh, deeds. And then that, that becomes a reason to kind of, for the Chinese government to say that any Uyghur who fights for uh, independence and ethnic uh, or self-determination is also an Islamic, Islamist terrorism, which is factually incorrect and uh, not true. But the more you push them that way, you will only force them to go that way, so you have this, this process. But that also justifies um, them creating these re-education camps, right? That's what we asked why they exist. In fact, um, the, the Chinese, um, uh, the current Chinese president has specifically uh, made reference to the U.S.'s, um, to the U.S.'s um, uh, 
to some of us is mistaken or, or exaggerated uh, uh, policies post 9-11 with uh, Guantanamo and so on, taking them as a model and telling the people in their directives uh, to use that model to, to kind of uh, and employ them against. Um, uh, so they built these Guantanamo base within China in many ways. Um, but, I mean, as a, as a reason to build them. Uh, because you can get there simply because you have prayed. Yeah, you can get there because you have, you have prayed at school, right? And you can get into this re-education camp just because of that. Um, and and, and oh, we're going to talk about these camps in a, in a, in a second. So that is the that is the second dimension, which, as I said, the Chinese government uses the post 11 world to kind of identify uh, the uh, independence movement or ethnic self determination with with Islamism, in the condition in which there is some Islamism also among uh, some Uyghurs. But you know, again, that too is a result of the processes we have just mentioned. Uh, and the third uh, the third aspect. Um, uh, that that we talked about is the nature of the of the regime, right? The communist regime, um, which uh, you know uh, requires uh, com complete um, co communism uh, wants to redefine uh, and to control uh, everything uh, in terms of how you live and 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 uh, exist, all all aspects of your existence. Yeah, so that that move. Literally from family to raising children to art to culture to to thought to to words to uh, what you do how you do how you relate to others and uh, I don't know gymnastics everything is redefined by ideology and it's controlled by ideology claims to be controlled by ideology this is why ideologists are so violent and pernicious um, and um, so inherently uh, faced with this different population there will be a clash and there will be a conflict because they are not. Uh, you know, okay, you have in, called, indoctrinated most of the Han, let's say, well, this is very different population. And here you have religion that is part of their very being as, as different ethnicity. And uh, so what do you do with that? Because um, <laughs> uh, you need to be atheist, you know, and uh, and all the rest. So, so um, part of the re-education effort and um, these education camps, in other words, are, um, by the way, not new things in, in, in China. The, their, their prevalence and their size and their implementation in the last few years in the specifically targeting Uyghur population is a new thing. The education camps have existed since communist China. And in fact, uh, I have linked a, a wonderful source um, in, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the blog, um, which is a collection of writings uh, from uh, such camps. Uh, and they're really, really uh, terrifying. Uh, I, I warmly recommend that you check them out. I also linked to, um, uh, included two links to excerpts from fragments from um, uh, the books, two books written by two survivors of these Uyghur re-education, Uyghur, Uyghur uh, targeted uh, re-education camps. So very recent. Uh, so I have a link to, you know, Mao's times re-education camps to kind of get a sense of what they are. And then also to very recent uh, uh, experiences of people who went through these camps, excerpts from there and, all, and the links in the books. Um, <clears throat> you can also find the links since we're there. Um, a great a dossier that the New York Times has prepared with uh, leaks, leaked documents that reveal the organized policy of the Chinese government, uh, organized oppression policy that is described there towards the Uyghur population. It's a fantastic, uh, I think about 450 documents. Um, the, the, the link is just to an article that summarizes them, but also to the originals um, and other good, good stuff, as usual. Um, so... Um, so the third, so the third dimension is the ideological dimension because inherently, communism uh, once tries uh, its its aim, its nature to control all aspects of your existence, and and the Uyghurs will be a, a, a clearly a very hard uh, rock to uh, swallow, so to speak. Um, and I mentioned that uh, today uh, the Uyghurs beyond, if we can talk about beyond, but beyond uh, the education camps, they are. It's it's one of the 
if China is a totalitarian, totalitarian state, which it is, uh, in, in many regards, um, the, it's nowhere more totalitarian than in uh, the Uyghur um, autonomous region, probably, maybe in Tibet. Uh, for all the reasons, uh, because here they can't, you know, they can't deal with these people, and and um, and just to give you some examples of what this means, and beware, we're going to talk about things that are really Orwellian level things, yeah. And again, this is reality. This is what's going on right now. So first of all, we know that China has been building a, a surveillance state, a surveillance state that uses the, the modern uh, technologies of ID identif identification. So basically. Uh, you go through the city, uh, and uh, uh, at the crossroads, you have uh, police with the computers, and you have CCTV cameras, who, and all the faces in the crowd are scanned. And, and you are in a database, because they have been building these databases, again, in the Uyghur ca Uyghur's case, seemingly they have been building uh, uh, physiognomy, uh, what do you call it, um, Anyway, physiognomy-based and DNA databases of the entire population. Okay, so so that the aim being to, for every Uyghur to be in the system, so you can be controlled completely, just like with the system that they have been developing of you know social credit. That if you misbehave, you lose uh, access to things. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the credit system, credit score system you know, in America is miserable enough. To have a social credit system, which if you misbehave against the party, you lose access to benefits and, and whatever uh, is, you know, frightening. So anyway, uh, let's, so the aim is to have a database, DNA and phys physiognomy database, uh, visual database of all Uyghurs. And, and so to keep track of them, identify them. And since, you know, now you have CCTV in the West as well, everywhere, you can just basically control physically the entire population. And there are some stories, probably some of them are linked. Um, I have linked uh, to, or I might have, uh, you know, because there's a lot of information about this, um, about, uh, you know, students who went home and suddenly they were pulled over by the police on the street because suddenly their, their face came up with a sort of a yellow circle instead of the green circle or something like that, like, okay, danger or a suspect individual, iffy individual. That's the level we're talking about. This is the level of the movie Brazil, the level of Orwell's 1984. And, um, and suspicious individual can mean, you know, why did you, uh, uh, you know, the equivalent of Christian, the equivalent would be baptize your child. Why did you, um, um, uh, uh, you know, you were, saw, uh, you were seen in entering a mosque, yeah? Because, for example, one of the things that the ways they clamp down is they uh, forbid the entrance into mosques of people younger than 18. They're basically trying to uh, eradicate religion um, and, and so on and so on. Uh, then, other examples. Um, uh, families get uh, suspicious families. For suspicious families, they install, the, the regime installs cameras in their homes. in uh, Not secret cameras, but like they come to your house and install cameras or they send people to live with you there's a whole movement of of uh, that they they bring in cadre right members of the party and each member of the party has the duty to survey to surveillance to surveil uh 10 families each of them has their like a network of informers but public yeah and they're the they're the guys who surveil like 10 families so so it uh, so and you know if they misbehave Write it down, they're sent to re-education camps. And is these re-education camps, as you will see from these fragments, um, are, uh, and I, I really encourage you to read these fragments, and if you can, to get that book about re-education camps in general, um, um, and to read the part, there's a, there's a fragment in that book that uh, summarizes experiences from the Gulag and other things that I linked. Uh, and uh, there's a, part, a fragment there called Prisoner of Mao, by Bao Ru something his name is Prisoner of Mao. If you get to read that, that 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 is one of the most powerful excerpts of um, of life in a re-education camp uh, I have ever read. Um, so so basically, it's like a caught brainwashing thing. So if you read these excerpts, excerpts, um, uh, and both of these books that refer to 
recent experiences in edu education comes from Uyghurs or Turkic people. Uh, they're written by women. So these are women's uh, prisons, uh, education camps. And you're taken. Uh, you don't know when, if, or, uh, if you will ever be uh, uh, freed. By the way, people disappear from among your cellmates uh, randomly um, uh, at various times. They never come back. Um, and from morning till evening, you have every day they have 11 hours of indoctrination. 11 hours of indoctrination in which, uh, for example, you can't uh, put your hand to your mouth because that might mean that you're, you have, you, you're um, not only that you're not paying attention, you were probably praying. So then you get beaten. This is all fact, so I'm not, this is, I'm not making up the things here. It sounds absurd, but just like with the war today happening in Ukraine, one of the things that I want to encourage people and that are students I work with is to wake up to the reality of the world we live in and to not think that whatever we have in our daily life here, maybe comfortable, maybe safe, is normality. Uh, or it's, it's a given, or everyone has it, and everything that is not this is an accident. To the contrary. Everything that we have is, is a, is a built-up construction that can fall apart. Uh, and, and not having it is more common than having it. Um, so, um, so, as I said, um, they... Um, uh, yeah, so from morning till evening... Uh, they can't, uh, and then they work all day, and then they're exhausted in the evening, and they can't talk in the in the cell as well because otherwise they they are uh, beaten, and also they're too tired to talk with each other. And uh, so this constant uh, surveillance and constant uh, uh, indoctrination, uh, they are basically what they're trying to do is to erase their identity and to re they're forbidden to speak Uyghur. They need to learn Han, uh, or, I know Mandarin. Uh, uh, and if they don't, for example, they need to do this pledge in the morning, with which they pledge themselves to the People's Republic and to, or, or sort of a thank you uh, pledge in the morning to the People's Republic and to the Communist Party and to the President, um, uh, Xi Jinping, who has been developing a very nice totalitarian regime in the last 10 years or so. Um, so, um, and cult of personality. So, so that's how the, uh, the, the day starts. And if you can't say those things in Mandarin, and many of them don't want to say they speak Mandarin, you don't get food. So they learn very quickly to say those things. Um, and you have these, these uh, testimonies of, of, uh, of, of these women, how they have given in to all of these things and, 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 and confessed to things they've never done. Because that's what, that's what re-education is, is. You are, the party can never be wrong. So if you're opposing what the party says you have done, you're actually lying because the party cannot be uh, wrong. So you are lying. So you have to, uh, you can, even if that's the truth, you're lying. So you have to change your reality and to accept the reality defined as defined by the party. And, and, uh, and, and the whole thing is against, against religion, against, uh, against Uyghur identity, and, and, and dissolving them into, so it's an experiment to forcibly and through violence uh, dissolving, is erasing their Uyghur identity for all three reasons that I mentioned. Uh, it's justified, it's violence, the violence of these means are justified through the post 9 11 world, saying that it's terrorism and Islamism. Um, they even make reference to, you know, the US is, uh, some of the US is uh, um, mistaken methods. Um, two, uh, in fact, what they're trying to do is ethnic cleansing by forced assimilation, yeah, re-education into being Chinese, yeah, uh, and and uh, three, um, it has to do with so it's a part of the nation building thing, nation nationalism, and uh, three, as I said, it's 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 part of the long standing policy of communism of controlling all of the aspects of your life. So that's why we have these re-education camps and that's what they're trying to do there. They're trying to create these, these sort of uh, machines by you push people in uh, and, uh, and uh, transform them into something else. And if it sounds brutal, it's because it is brutal. It is brutal psychologically, uh, physically, and, and it also is devastating to the society because people are taken to these education camps like this 
and and suddenly families are uh, you know children remain without parents uh, uh the, the male who worked uh, leaves and there's no one to to maintain the family to keep the family to work for the family there's huge uh, amounts of or lack of, of workforce because they get uh, <laughs> uh, they're taken away uh, into these re-education camps so it, it creates huge uh, social turmoil and of course if you have uh, orphan children you need to create institutions to deal with that so it creates huge societal problems and challenges to the Chinese regime as well because nothing replaces the family in terms of you know if it disappears you need to create institutions to 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 do what a family would do normally on a daily basis without paying them um, and um, um, so, for example, um, jailed for praying. Abdul Salam Muhammad, 41, the police detained him for reciting a verse of the Quran at a funeral and re education. Um, uh, then, searching homes for forbidden books. That sounds familiar? Yeah, that's a communist, but slash religion, slash nationalism thing. Um, as I told you about the, the cadres, the DNA database, facial recognition, that's what I was talking about. Um, so that is the situation in in um, that is the situation in in, in uh, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, which is not Uyghur Autonomous Region because it's actually run by the Han, whom they have brought in because they don't trust the, 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 the local Uyghur population. And that is, that is what is uh, uh, happening uh, there. Um, how can this change? Well, um, it's very, very hard. It's very, very hard uh, because of all these things that I just that I just uh, uh, mentioned, um, they uh, the first of all one it all is happening it is all happening within the borders of the Chinese uh, People's Republic, um, and uh, there's a sort of reluctance to intervene in the within the sovereign territory of a state. Now, of course, during the wars in Yugoslavia, we, we realized that that's baloney. And there's uh, this whole concept that was developed also since then uh, and uh, sort of uh, put in the books at the UN, which doesn't mean much because it's not mandatory to respect anything there that is passed by the UN, but it's in the document. So it's in the international lingo, international law lingo, which is R2P, which is responsibility to protect, which means that states also uh, have the responsibility to protect not just the sovereignty of each um, of the states of the world, which is the, what the principle of the UN, uh, the principle on which the UN was formed, right? The whole United Nations, or ironically called the United Nations, because it's United States, yeah? Anyway, it's, it's based on the principle of the sovereignty and um, inviolability of the, its member states. And uh, the, the sort of the whole principle is that we should all defend this. Now, of course, we all know how effective the UN is. Uh, but a newer you know, we, we have learned <coughs> after Rwanda and Yugoslavia that this is kind of nonsensical because the Charter of the UN starts with the human Declaration of International Declaration of uh, uh, Human of the Rights of Man, of the human being, right? Where uh, you know, right to life, right to all of these things, uh, and when people are massacred on mass in the name or under the cover of sovereignty, that kind of clashes with the whole purpose of. You know, statehood is a sort of a secondary to the uh, Charter of the Human Rights. Uh, so the R2P is the idea of protecting uh, uh, populations who are uh, um, on the brink of being, you know, uh, decimated, like through ethnic cleansing or genocide and so on, under the cover of sovereignty, putting sovereignty sort of a secondary to the responsibility to protect such populations. Now, of course, this is a nice principle, but making it effective is very hard. Because, of course, if you have to deal with a weaker state like Serbia, uh, during the wars in Yugoslavia, it's easier to do something about it. Uh, if you have to do, deal with a state that has nuclear weapons uh, like China or Russia, it's harder to do anything about it. The second thing, uh, problem here is, as I said, the 9-11, the post-9-11 world, uh, because that kind of stops. Um, uh, it's a huge obstacle to, to, to these uh, uh, claims 
um, by the Uyghurs because they are, um, as I said, it's uh, their attempts at self-governance or uh, fighting for independence are uh, repackaged and interpreted or explained as uh, you know um, Islamism or and so on. Plus, there is some Islamism as well among among them because of the factors we have mentioned. So that makes it very hard uh, to to clarify because for an, for an uninformed observer, it's like well they're terrorists uh, and it's all lumped together, and so it becomes hard. Third, um, and here's here's an interesting thing because you it's sort of counterintuitive. Uh, after 1991, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the, it's it's uh, crumbling. Many new states were formed, including in Central Asia, many Turkic states, like Turkmenistan, as I said, um, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and so on. And these uh, Turkic states also, some of these ethnic groups are also in this Xinjiang region. In fact, the, exactly the ethnic groups I mentioned, except for the Uyghurs. So the Uyghurs don't have uh, like an external Turkic mother state. Because that would be an important factor, an advocate for them. Uh, and this is known in the literature that you know ethnic groups that don't have a sort of a mother state, mother state to, to speak for them and to defend their rights in a world of states, uh, they're at a huge, um, uh, you know, it's in, it, they're in a much more detrimental position. Um, uh, but you would say, okay, but these are all, you know, these, these Turkic groups, they're, in many cases, in many ways, they're similar and there's uh, affinities and so on. So how come that these Turkic states uh, that were formed after 91 didn't become protectors of the uh, um, population of um, uh, Xinjiang uh, region? And, uh, well, they did not, surprisingly. Uh, at first, there were some attempts, but um, they themselves internally, um, uh, most of them are not very democratic, Internally, he wanted to clamp down on, on nationalist groups, uh, so groups who would uh, would be prone to supporting these these populations from the neighboring China, uh, and also they 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 uh, simply did not want to be in a bad relationship with China because they, after uh, becoming independent, these countries for, from Central Asia, many of them are not were not doing very well, so they depended on their richer neighbors uh, on on many things. So. And China is very harsh in um, imposing its national interest internationally. So um, very, very quick to punish those who, who trespass on their national interest. Again, ironically, because it's supposed to be a communist state, but it's actually highly nationalistic. But so, so they actually are not huge defenders of the or population of uh, Xinjiang, of the Turkic populations of Xinjiang, surprisingly so. Although there are some support and there are some. You know, some of the Uyghur associations um, around the world are located, for example, in Turkey. But Turkey also did never become, never did become, um, uh, it never became um, a defender of the rights of the Turkic people in um, Xinjiang. Again, kind of surprising because they're quite active otherwise. For example, they're very uh, uh, actively supporting Turkmenistan as a state because of their affinity. They even call it Turkmenistan and Turkey. Uh, same people in two states, you know, they say they were the same. And so they supported them in the recent war with Armenia, where Armenia was backed by Russia. <clears throat> so anyway, speaking of uh, another source of support would be um, international organizations supporting kind of uh, the interest of the, of, the, of the Uyghurs. And I have linked to the World Uyghur Congress um, uh, as the, the major association uh, that does that. And um, um, so that you have it. Um, but these associations too were, were highly divided for a long time. Now this is kind of the big umbrella organization, but they were highly divided and it's always not helpful when you're, um, those who are supposed to represent you and to speak for you are speak with different voices and, and conflict uh, between them. Part of these conflicts also being because Chinese are very good at, the Chinese government is very good at one, persecuting even abroad those who work against its national interest and two, uh, infiltrating them with spies and, and paid people. So undermining these organizations who are active targets of Chinese, you know, secret uh, services and so on. Uh, so, um, so you have all these things that work against the 
capacity of the older population to uh, speak up. But we have, on the other hand, you know, NGOs, nonprofits, uh, U.S. government at times, not really after 9-11, because then, then we were so obsessed with the war on terror, uh, partly rightly so, but partly with exaggerations that we now regret. Um, uh, so so uh, we have some countries who have become much more aware of specifically now the situation of the Uyghurs because of all this information that we have received and all these new you know horrific uh, uh, information about the, these, these uh, education camps where uh, remember probably about one in ten one in eight uh, Uyghurs are now in the education camp and remember that image from the from the beginning. And those who are not in education camps live in an Orwellian totalitarian uh, society uh, are, and are at any moment in danger of being sent to a re-education camp. Um, and uh, I'll let you read more about <coughs> all these <coughs> in the uh, in the uh, documents I have linked. So um, that's uh, that's what I. Uh, these are kind of the major things I wanted to go over. Um, and the purpose of this whole thing was a sort of an introduction into, as I said, into a, de a closer look at the, at, at, you know, uh, at the, the situation of Uyghurs in China from starting from that ic iconic, it's a misused uh, word, image of those detainees, uh, blindfolded detainees, and what we have learned about these re-education camps, and to ask ourselves, as normally one would ask uh, oneself, what's going on there? So this was a sort of an introduction into, uh, meant to be an answer to that, uh, the beginning of an answer to that, what's going on there. Uh, because it is a huge uh, human rights problem right now in the world. Um, and unfortunately, even, even if, you know, major publications have dealt with this and people talk about this, uh, besides all those obstacles I mentioned, there's also the problem that many, uh, for example, companies like Disney, for example, uh, have... Um, not uh, taking into account the the brutal situation there, and uh, for example, have filmed movies in the region and so on, which they should not do, which they should not do, uh, because you are on a, on a, on a uh, you know you're right in the midst of a of a, of an ethnic ethnic cleansing, and implicitly, uh, sort of you're kind of giving your okay to this. By, by 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 playing along, by going along as if nothing will be happening. Uh, so there needs to be um, better understanding, a sense of urgency, uh, and also an understanding of what's what's uh, uh, going on on the, on this on this issue. Oh, and one more thing. Um, one of the um, books that I use to kind of, um, which is a very good introduction into this whole uh, question of the Uyghurs, is a book that came out in. Um, 2010, uh, which by uh, Garner Bovingon, uh, again linked in the blog, uh, the book is called The Uyghurs, Strangers in Their Own Land. Uh, and it's a good overview of the entire context of the uh, um, uh, situation, and I got a lot from it. Um, so I recommend it as an introduction, and a lot of what you've heard from me, uh, the, the context uh, I got from that, from that book. Uh, besides other uh, sources, but this, a lot of it came um, uh, sort of. I wanted to introduce you to this book as part of this, um, um, you know, this this fragment of our podcast. Okay, so that's uh, that's part one of our podcast: um, uh, China and the Uyghurs, dealing with China and the Uyghurs, and uh, uh, part two, we'll deal, as I said, as usually we do. Um, in part two, we talk about maybe a book, a documentary, a film, and so on. But that I have called the second part of this podcast, of today's podcast, Understanding Russia. And here I need to make a, a differentiation, a, a clarification. Understanding doesn't, does not mean uh, uh, agreeing. Understanding doesn't mean uh, getting along. Understanding simply means ma uh, understanding, meaning uh, under, uh, 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 learning more about uh, a subject and uh, having a better comprehension of the processes, uh, aspects, factors, elements, facts that, that characterize that, that thing. That's all it is. So, for example, understanding Hitler doesn't mean that I say, oh, yeah, I understand you, Hitler. 
your find, now I see. <laughs> uh, no, it simply means understand it, comprehending his uh, the mechanism of his thoughts, the, his principles, uh, what allowed him to rise to, to rise to power, or whatever it is. Yeah, that's what it means. Understand. Uh, and uh, this also kind of takes me to the uh, the concept of Russland Versteher, which is uh, an expression that's used in uh, German politics uh, and kind of derisively referring to the politicians, the German politicians, especially from the Social Democratic Party, who historically has have been, um, uh, 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 and in this case, understanding is underst is actually means sort of getting along, uh, taking the side of whatever. So the Social Democrats who historically have been always more uh, leaning towards, uh, well, let's understand the Russians and sort of in the sense of, you know, let's see their point of view and maybe, you know, see the th things from their point of view and uh, sort of uh, get along with them and get uh, 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 sort of play along with them and all that thing. So, no, understanding Russia does not mean that from my perspective. And from the perspective of what I'm trying to do here, uh, and this is understanding Russia one, as I would like to do a second part um, uh, next time, uh, hopefully. Uh, and uh, for each of these uh, part sections, each of these um, uh, sections of the pod podcast uh, today and in the next podcast, I have chosen a book. Uh, and the book that I'm, I have chosen for today, of course, it's going to be linked in the blog, is uh, from uh, Vladimir Sorokin, uh, Russian author, The Day of the Oprichnik. The Day of the Oprichnik. Um, it's a fantastic book. It's a contemporary book. Um, now, um, I've chosen it because it has been recommended uh, by different sources. Uh, I... Um, and I was interested in, in, in seeing it. It's a, it's a literary book. It's not a documentary book. Uh, I would say that for understanding what's happening within Russia right now, or at least in the 2000s, um, uh, the best book for that is from Peter Pomerantsev. Nothing is true and everything is possible. And I'm planning something uh, to write something on that. So it's not going to be part of the podcast. It's, it's uh, part of my writing. Um, and that's the best way to understand Russian society. This is a this uh, and that's not a fiction book. That is more of a documentary, but this is a fiction book. And um, and the um, the one that I'm we're going to talk about next week is uh, no next week next podcast is also a fiction book. But um, it's a fiction book written in the tradition of of um, uh, of a famous tradition of uh, people like Gogol and Chekhov and uh, Bulgakov, uh, because it's a it's a satire. Uh, it's a satire that kind of goes to the essence of what is of, of Russia. What is it? What is, what is Russia? Yeah, that's, that's kind of what it is. And this is why I'm talking about understanding Russia. Uh, not in the sense, again, of more, uh, you know, uh, getting along, getting, uh, getting uh, agreeing, or any of such things. It's simply what it says, comprehending. Um, and what is really great about this book, what is really great about this book, um, so what is it? Uh, it came out in 2006. Uh, and it's, it was meant to depict us the Russia uh, after 20 years. So it would be 2026, but we can easily take it as being 2046. Or 20 years from now, 2042, whatever. So it's a Russia in the near future. That's what it means. That's what it is. Now, some call it a dy dystopian, um, uh, uh, you know, a piece of writing. I would disagree. Um, because that kind of might mean something very remote from, from reality. But what I find to be the strength of this book, and I really enjoyed uh, it for that reason, is that it really, almost prophetically, goes to some, some things that, that are seem to be perennial aspects of Russian uh, culture, or maybe uh, society, or maybe political culture, all, all of these together. Uh, and in fact, the world that it describes is a world, as I said, that happens 20 years in the future, in the very near future. But it's a world that kind of has all the aspects of Tsarism, uh, Soviet Russia, uh, Russia, Communist Russia, Russia is part of Soviet, the Soviet Union, and post-1989 and Putin uh, sort of time, uh, Russia. So it's these three ages, but all kind of collapsed into one picture of, of, uh, of Russia. And what's, what's really uh, this is the reason I call it prophetic, and I don't use this word very lightly. Of course, I don't mean it 
in the sense of religious prophecy, but in the sense of some of the things that he describes then in 2006 are true today in 2022, kind of like 20 years later, but are really true. And if you would have asked me maybe a year ago if they would be true, I would have said, well, no. Uh, but they have become true and very close. So I'm going to, uh, be, uh, what I'm going to try to do here is to, to go to, to identify some of these uh, point some of these aspects that 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 kind of seem to be perennial aspects of Russian society and political culture. You know, there's this famous um, uh, article by Milan Kundera, uh, "The Tragedy of Central Europe." I always recommend it to students when we talk about Central Europe, uh, and it's written by Kundera in the 1980s uh, when uh, Central Europe was obviously under Russian Soviet influence, not part of some Soviet Union, but under Soviet influence uh, in the sense that they, uh, these countries in Central Europe had communist regimes propped up by uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and um, and the, the tragedy of Central Europe, uh, among other things, besides talking about the countries of Central Europe like Hungary, Poland, Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, and so on, uh, also um, defines what it means to be Central European, contrasting it to the alien nature not just of communism that was oppressing those countries and they never chose to to, to have that regime but uh of uh the russian culture because uh kundera as, as, as a slav uh, coming from the being a czech he would uh, uh, he wrote this book in france so he would go to the west and he would obviously in a very annoying way which to, <laughs> which i can understand perfectly he would be um, identified as a Slav and, you know, basically just like the Russians. And that's truly very grating because it's, these are very, very different culture, radically different culture. So part of the tragedy of the Central Europe is also the, a sharp definition of, what, of how Central Europe and the Slavs of Central Europe, uh, Northern Slavs like Czechs, Polish, uh, Slovaks, whatever, they're not Russians because the Russian culture is very different and alien in so many ways. Now, of course, Kundera, as I, are huge fans of the great Russian writers and thinkers. Um, I personally am a, I'm a huge fan of uh, Chekhov, for example. Uh, but uh, and uh, some of the things that they write about have to do with the eternally human condition, and that's what any great writer does, talks about the human condition as such, and you can relate to it. But that doesn't mean, does not mean that, that um, uh, you know, there's a culture, and there are cultural differences between, you know, what is uh, Russian culture and other cultures, and for, for better or worse. But they're very different. Okay? So in, it is in that sense that I um, go to this, to this book and I, and I notice, as I said, in this description of a, of a, of a world that happens uh, in the near future, uh, I notice these um, and I identified, and I'm going to share with you some of these traits that seem to be part of the the ongoing challenges or uh, perennial traits of Russian culture or society or political culture that also represent challenges to politics. And this is the value of the book because they have, you, you can see that this has been happening for so long and some of these are very negative. And, and any politics uh, politician, including Putin, this is why he was so successful because he came in and dealt with some of these but then also fell prey to others. Uh, so it's important to understand and know some of these traits because it helps us deal with politics because politics, you can take the same wonderful model and it, it works in Switzerland, it's not going to work in Russia. Yeah? The same institutions, the same rules, the same laws, wholesale and just put it there and it's not going to work. So why wouldn't it want it work? Because societies are different and they really won't work in Germany either because Switzerland is not Germany. Uh, societies are different and cultures are different and so on. Okay. Um, so what are some of these perennial aspects of, um, of politics? Well, first of all, as I said, the regime that he depicts in the future is a combination of Tsarist Russia. So you have an emperor uh, in this near future that uh, is an absolute uh, ruler of uh, the near future Russia. Uh, it's a society that is almost quasi-feudal. Uh, feudalism, you have a noble caste. It's a society divided into castes or, you know, classes. Uh, and most of the most of the people are, you know, serfs. All very true for Russian history, and also sort of remaining in the consciousness. Um, 
this is, comes from the Tsarist Russia, and it's part of the book. Then from the Soviet uh, Russia, uh, Soviet Union, um, he has in the book, in the regime that he depicts, uh, is the Soviet terror, Stalinist terror, and the tools, uh, a totalitarian regime that is very similar to the Stalinist regime. Uh, with dissidents and people who uh, anti-West, uh, ideologically anti-West, with violent control of the population and extermination of enemies, purges. Now that's Stalinist, but that's also in this regime that he depicts. And then he comes uh, from the post-1989 Putin regime. Uh, he has the, um, well, what is the Oprichnik? The Oprichnik is basically, would be what today in Putin's regime are the Siloviki. And the Siloviki are members, former members, uh, or current or former members of the, or covered, undercover members of the uh, secret services of KG, KGB, then the FSB. Um, and uh, Putin's regime has a network of uh, Siloviki, because he's from, he's a Siloviki himself. And he kind of created a network of, of former, and maybe even current FSB, KGB, that he has, with which he has infiltrated all the, all the institutions of the state and of the economy. And that's kind of one of his main levels of power because he has this network like a, like a, like a, a spider, yeah, uh, a net of, of, of people from his, of his own kind from the secret service. And that's the, the main tool through which he controls the state and the economy in Russia. And the Oprichnik are sort of like the Siloviki, but uh, as a very specific caste uh, within this um, an institution, uh, sort of law, well, law enforcement institution in this regime that he depicts in uh, near future Russia. Uh, and also another thing that uh, resembles post-1989 or slash Putin's Russia is that what he depicts here is a mafia state uh, in which uh, the, behind uh, the official uh, institutions is actually a, a, a network uh, that is dedicated just to the enrichment of the individuals that have those positions. And the, he describes these very powerfully. So the style of the book, I want I need to mention a few things. It's, uh, it's satire, but it's, it's, but it's, it's a very well-written satire. It is uh, a satire that goes into the grotesque, yeah, like uh, um, uh, Hieronymus Bosch painting, grotesque, and this also has a tradition in uh, in Russian literature, and naturalism, that also has a tradition in Russian literature, or Emile Zola in French literature. Um, uh, but it's also a contemporary book, which also has some of the thoughts of the contemporary books. Uh, for example, um, sort of a, 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 a unwelcome uh, sort of uh, well, not very often. I think it's two instances or so. An unwelcome, uh, um, almost pornographic uh, 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 scenes, but they they remain artistic. Let's be very very clear. But one of the things that I that's a different story that I dislike in the in the contemporary authors is the sort of the random in inclusion of of a, of a uh, sexually explicit. Not that it's sexually explicit. I don't. Um, if it's artistic, it's, it makes sense. But uh, inclusion for the sake of inclusion, which makes it pornographic, because you don't want, you know, it does the same work. Well, that's not quite true here, because the inclusion, and I'm going to make this case here, although it's very explicit, it remains artistic and also says something very powerful. But it, it, in its detail, it, it remains kind of very, very explicit. And um, that's where it loses some of the artist, its artistic nature. But so, so that's kind of... Anyway, I think naturalism, grotesque, satire, and some of the faults of modern uh, literature, I think it kind of summarizes this book. Um, overall, a very powerful book. Um, okay, so some of those traits. So what do we see here? Statism. Yeah, the, that the state, and these are, as I said, things that have been perpetually part of Russian politics and that might not be part of the politics as you understand it, or American politics, or German politics, or French politics, or whatever it is. You need to understand that. Because that's part of the sort of the Russian, uh, not psyche, because there's other thing, but a political culture and how people think about politics and what people expect from politics. And uh, if you don't respond to this in either way by delivering what they want or by delivering something else that supplants this need, then you will fail as politician. Yeah. So Yeltsin failed because he he allowed for freedom, but with a very weak state. Now when Putin came in, he reinforce the state, the famous vertical, power vertical, uh, uh, in order to make order in the society. And people rewarded that, and it had huge positive effects. But now, 
this whole thing has been transformed into a totalitarian regime because you reinforce the state, reinforce the state until the state is empty. So statism is one aspect of, of Russian sort of political culture that has always been there. The idea of the state being above everything, almost uh, divine-like. And the state, however, associated or under the power of the ruler, who is above the state, but sort of uh, the state and the ruler sort of being interchangeable. And, and that's also that's what you that's what you see here uh, depicted in this book very well. <clears throat> a quote from the book: uh, uh, He, the, the main protagonist, is an opritchnik, one of these siloviki, one of these you know secret police uh, who goes around enforcing the will of the of the emperor. And um, his goal for life, his moral uh, goal, his his uh, ethos, is to lead quote a passionate, heroic government life. Right? Nobody in America wants to <laughs> lead the government life because it's not part of this the psyche here, of the political culture here. That doesn't make it right or wrong. I'm just saying this is why it's useful to read books. This is why it's useful to, this is why competitive politics is so fascinating because it all has to start from understanding the society you're talking about and then you can talk about its politics. Um, so, um, so there's the, so statism. There's this that the state is above everything, and the service to the state is the highest thing. Uh, it also brings you prestige, uh, but also sort of the state is the is the is the greatest thing because the state is sort of associated with the nation, uh, and it uh, but it's also subordinated to the ruler, uh, and the ruler is the state, um, and and you serve all of this. You have power, but you also are it's sort of a, a, the most powerful and noble enterprise. It's a, it's a vocation. Um, just like in Germany, for example, a civil service career has a huge prestige, the same in France, which here is not true. Um, then, absolutism. Uh, well, what we have here is an absolute uh, rule uh, of the uh, emperor. Um, and absolute rule is a technical term. Um, absolutism, uh, really, you know, people are confused about the term and its reality. Absolutism is a phenomenon of modernity. Absolute monarchs did not really exist in the Middle Ages because in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, what society in Western Europe was characterized by was that above everything there is God. So the rule of God or natural law is the highest. Now, absolutism means when the will of the king becomes the, is the law. And the, so the, the king becomes God. Now, that could not be in, in Middle Ages when it was clear that you are under the, the, the God and under the rule of God. Uh, a king could not be absolute. Uh, it could be good, could be wrong, could be powerful or powerful, but not absolute. Uh, absolutism. This is why it came about in the in the modernity because we lost this idea of a, a rule, a natural law, or a rule of God, uh, uh, and God is himself as a, as, a, as a ruler of all. And then you know the the one who had most power, like Louis the Fourteenth, right, the Sun King and whatever. Uh, you know he was an absolute ruler, meaning that there was nothing above him. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's also goes back to 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 as I said to the Russian history, and is also what's described here. Uh, and again, quote from the book: "His Majesty's will is law and mystery, and thank God for that." There you go. And I said the the book is fantastic. And if you know what to look for, such you know how it depicts, how it really puts the point and defines in clear sentences these aspects. If you know what to look for, you identify these perennial aspects of Russian politics. But what's the implicit, uh, what's the um, conclusion, what's the consequence of the fact that the, the, there is an absolute uh, rule of, uh, of the emperor, that you have an absolute ruler, is that everyone else has no rule, right? Because this is absolute rule and everyone else is uh, um, um, subordinate, everyone else is flat, yeah? Except for those who work for the ruler. Yeah, so there's a courtly life here. There's the nobles. Uh, there's the family of the emperor, and there's the enforcers of the emperor, right? Some key institutions, and uh, 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 they they have power by virtue of being, you know, uh, closest to the emperor. But the rest is a flat serf. So ninety percent serfs, very few holders of power. They have all the power. We have no power. But this has been constant in Russian history. And even today, when you uh, watch some of these, uh, for example, um, uh, people on the street sort of interviews in Russia, they ask them about the intervention in Ukraine and the, the effects of the um, sanctions on the uh, on Russia and what will be with their life. 
and you are perhaps surprised, you can be surprised by hearing that, well, whatever will be, will be. We've survived such things. It's a sort of a historically created and ingrained um, equanimity uh, towards uh, in the fluctuations uh, of luck and of life. And, you know, sort of uh, being willing to put up with very bad things because, well, that's what life has brought to these people during their, I don't know, 60 years of existence. Uh, just think of what they went through. And they have learned to, to survive no matter what comes. And this feeling of, I have, I have no tools or to change the reality is also one of the main reasons why Putin is in power. And he knows these things and he uses these things. Um, because he, he, he knows, he told it to... Um, to whom I think to um, one of the Western leaders, when they met, he told them that um, I think Angela Merkel, that you know as well as I do, he said, Putin, that Russians need a strong leader. Now this seems like a very banal uh, sentence, but it's in this context of of if there's no that uh, there's no tradition because of a lack in Russian history of a middle class. The middle class is very recent as a as a major strata of the population. Uh, there's a tradition of, of not having a voice and of being of, of uh, completely disenfranchised, in which case you need a strong ruler who you don't necessarily love, you probably hate and are envious about. The, the relationship is not of love, but you need it to fill this void of power because you have not learned to live independently, autonomously. And I'm not talking that Russians have not learned to live independently, autonomously. I'm talking about phenomena, social phenomena, uh, mass, at mass level. Right? Like, what do people generally expect? I'm not talking about Moscow or St. Petersburg, where you have a middle class now, and people who are independent, and many of them have left Russia. I'm talking about the other 80 million, 90 million people in, in Russia who live in some small uh, villages and so on and so on. Uh, also, um, the... the um, okay, then... Um, Then you have um, the idea of, uh, as I said, um, of opposition to the regime as a dissidence. So not opposition party, but those who are op in opposition are enemies of the state. And they need to hide, they, or they need to leave the country, or, or they, or, uh, and so opposing the regime, becoming a dissident is, uh, is, makes you an enemy, yeah? totalitarian regime and uh, so you have all kinds of fragments of uh, you know he is in the car and uh, switches on f uh, western radio stations like Radio Free Europe as it was you know they broadcast during communism but even now again uh, all these western tools to transmit the voice of liberty in um, uh, countries under totalitarian regimes or um, he uh, sends uh, one of the operations is sent I think, uh, abroad to uh, infiltrate maybe, but anyway, to contact some of the dissident, uh, uh, dissidents there. This again goes back to Russian history of literally always you had these dissident populations living in the European capitals. So those who opposed the regime at home could not stay at home and they left. That's also true now, especially now after um, the invasion of Ukraine, when Russia has become for its purposes a, a totalitarian. Uh, a totalitarian state, um, and because uh, that's what it is right now. Uh, remember that right now, if you um, say the word war, uh, you uh, and not a special operation, you can get up to fifteen years in prison. So right now, you have a, a totalitarian state where, where people uh, you can go to to prison for saying the wrong thing, uh, just like that. Um, and all you know, um, up until February twenty four, you still had some opposition newsletters, uh, news um, outlets, TV, radio, newspaper. They're gone. They're all shut down. Right now, Russia is a totalitarian state. So just like what he describes, um, and also the idea of um, the importance of culture and of controlling culture in a totalitarian regime, by which I mean uh, literature and what is being published and how. And he has a whole um, uh, thing about which books are approved. And there's a section of the uh, basically secret police who approves books. And uh, just like it was during KGB and 
um, uh, uh, you know, what books can be printed and cannot, uh, and are approved or not. Um, then he has this whole, um, then there's this whole opposition between Russia and the West, and this is, okay, you would say, okay, again, like Stalinist, like during the Stalinist era, it's actually more like how it is today right now. So if you turn on the TV, Russian TV right now, the entire rhetoric, in a scary fashion really, is that Russia is at war with the West, and the West is evil. And so it's, it's, it's as I said, it's a mix of all these periods, but right now, what, what he describes is closest to what is happening right now. Not in 2006, right now, as I said. Quite prophetic. Uh, because um, he talks about a, a Western wall that was built in the book, uh, between Russia and the West, and uh, nobody passes, basically. Well, that's what's happening right now. <laughs> there's, a, there's a wall. Of course, the, here, in the book, it's physical, but there's a wall in, in the sense of complete isolation of Russia from the West. Literally, that's what's happening right now. And the co corollary of this is that Russia, the only remaining partner is China. That's exactly what's happening right now. And also what's going to happen in the near future, if the situation continues, that R China uses this to kind of infiltrate and um, uh, uh, sort of control the Russian economy becoming its main uh, producer of goods and then buyer of, of uh, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, raw goods or whatever, and which is what's going to happen right now and probably will happen if the, this isolation of Russia continues. Literally, there is a wall now between Russia and the West in the sense of people can, can't leave, um, many people can't leave, they're not allowed to leave from uh, either side. Uh, and there's a separation, there's no, you know, commerce is broken down. There is a wall of, of sanctions that is as powerful as any wall, and through, as in the book, the physical wall. Another thing in the, in the book is about the gas, because it's still um, sending gas to Europe, uh, but, but it cuts it as a way to blackmail or to uh, uh, obtain international um, goals, uh, whatever, to pursue international uh, goals. Uh, the emperor does that, which is what right now is happening. <laughs> Putin is doing, uh, and this is not, of course, uh, that that prophetic as they've been doing it, but literally it's happening right now. How 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 um, you know Russia is uh, trying to blackmail different countries by uh, um, telling them that they would cut the gas, and that's what's happening in the book as well. Um, and then uh, another aspect. Uh, so, but that's uh, the corruption. And here, um, it's the dimensions of corruption. And again, this is more closer to the, to the age of uh, 1990s and Putin, that, that uh, we can really talk about a mafia state in the sense of a, of a captive state. Uh, a captive state is a state where uh, the institutions of the state proper Right, whatever is meant to to perform the um, functions of, of the state, right? Uh, taxation, border control, law and order, agriculture, military, the education, everything that the state is supposed to do, let's say in a country. Those who inhabit these positions in the institutions of the state use the positions not to perform those uh, um, uh, services and to deliver those those goods and to um, uh, those functions, but to for uh, pr uh, subjective private their own uh, enrichment. So it you it's like you get a function in the state which has to perform certain uh, a position in the state which has to perform certain functions, but you treat it like a, a, your own little you know serfdom and it's only for your own enrichment. Well. You do some of those public functions, but behind it, you use that that position to get very rich. Well, that's kind of that's the mafia state. That's the well, that's the captive state. And I, when I say mafia state, is that there's some very powerful scenes in the book about uh, how literally they behave like the mafia, like the, the Oprichniks have the boss, like it could be Tony Soprano, just as well, because the behavior is the same. Uh, and and the relationships and the dynamic between them is like Tony Soprano with his fellows. Um, uh, 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 behind the strip bar there, and uh, uh, you know, including you know, everybody comes to the boss at the end of the day and tells them how much money they made and give their cut to the boss or give the money to the boss and the boss give them the cut. Literally like a mafia, but that's that's true to a large degree to what is happening 
uh, in, in Russia that there's a, still a strata, maybe larger than before, but a strata of oligarchs. They also allowed some middle class, but there's a strata of oligarchs that, that, that are extremely uh, uh, ridiculously rich, including Putin. And there's an 80% of the population or 60, 70% who is, who is, who is uh, well, I don't know how much percent, who is very poor. And then there's some middle class, but as I said, they're losing them as well. Um, uh, and I mean, when we're talking about, you know, villages, uh, millions of people who have no uh, running water, uh, toilet inside, uh, 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 gas, uh, you know, in, in the villages in which they live in Russia today. And um, why, right? Because all the, that money, as, as we have seen with the uh, invasion in Ukraine, you see that whatever is on paper is not true, that everybody uses their positions to steal as much as they can. Uh, and it, all of this is in, the, is, in the, uh, is in the, not only in the book, but it's also sort of a knowledge, a known thing. Meaning that even in the relationship with the, with the, with the, her, his majesty, with the emperor, I don't even think if it's called the, the emperor, I think it's called his majesty, but I'm referring to him as the emperor, the ruler of all. Uh, they, um, uh, the Oprichniks, the emperor knows that there is this whole mafia system. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure he also benefits from it, and he kind of acknowledges it. But at the same time, they also have the official functions of the Oprichnik, and these, these two la la layers are known. So they coexist, one, one the formal one, and, uh, which has its functions and does its functions. You know, they go and purge, you know, the opponents of the regime and whatever. And then next, you know, in, immediately after leaving the house and burning it down and, you know, raping the woman, which is sort of the procedure that they follow, then they have um, the, oh, and now I'm going to collect my, my, my mafia money. <laughs> and that's also part of their job, sort of, but the, the informal part of their job. It, it's quite powerful, but it's also, it's so, it, this is what's wonderful about satire and the satire where it is well done or, and the grotesque, that all of these are highly emphasized. They're made highly visible. Uh, and you would say, okay, highly visible, you know, it can be highly visible in some, I need, you know, dystopian, you know, Hunger Games or whatever. But yeah, but this is also true. So it's, it's, an, it's a pastiche of reality and this is why this book is powerful because it takes it has the sense of identifying these traits in reality or maybe in the perennial reality of russian society to a degree and then heighten it uh, underline it um, thicken the lines and make them pop out through the grotesque through the exaggeration um okay then uh, the whole the whole idea of nationalism and Russian identity, the idea of uh, Eurasianism, the idea of the wall, we were not European, we are our own thing, um, uh, and, and nationalism. Uh, he says, and most important of all, Russia is alive and well, rich, huge, united. Uh, although there are ethnic, and again, Russian identity with all its uh, problems, as we have mentioned, Meaning, it talks about the purity of the Russian blood versus Russia's empire and all the other ethnic groups. And really, they're secondary in value to the ethnic Russian. Exactly the conflicts we'll be talking about. It's also in the book. As I said, the role of China, how, how China now is the key partner. And there's a hilarious thing that the book, the Oprichnik is driving, is a Mer, 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 Merchedov, which is the Mercedes, but Ru Russianized, Mercedov, but made in China. And I just read today an article how uh, China, uh, how uh, the Russian government has taken over the Renault factory because Renault has left Russia because of the war. And the Russian government has taken over the Renault factory and they're going to make um, a, a car called uh, Moscovite. It's almost like Versedov, Moscovite, but it's a car on the Chinese model. It's literally the book. It's literally the book. <laughs> the Chinese bring the know-how. They kind of control the whole thing or, you know, sort of support the whole system. Uh, in many ways, Russia is kind of a vassal to China here, although it has, it's independent, it's friendly, but it's kind of supported by China. All the good stuff comes from there. Uh, and he even ponders, like, how oh, is this good? And, and that's kind of what's, where we're going. And literally today I was reading about this Moscovite car that's going to be made by taking over Renault based on what? A Chinese car. Fantastic. Um, 
and uh, he says here, good lord, how many Chinese there are, meaning there's, a, as I said, a penetration of uh, Chinese, of the Russian uh, um, economy, society, uh, sort of, they run the economy in many ways. Um, uh, okay, another aspect is is a formal, formalized superstition, superstitious, um, hypocritical, anti-religion. Religion is ritual. Uh, and that kind of penetrates the entire book from the beginning. Um, but it, uh, And this goes to, to an aspect of, um, uh, let's say all, all denominations have their own vulnerabilities. Um, if, if that is so, um, the Orthodox, uh, the Byzantine Orthodox uh, Christian denominations, churches, one of their vulnerabilities clearly is the fact that they are uh, state-based. Meaning, unlike the Catholic Church, let's say, which has a worldwide uh, international organization, which is a saving point for local churches because they can always refer to the source of authority uh, and the line of uh, and the line of institutional line that goes beyond the local state. Uh, the Orthodox churches define themselves; they're autocephalous, meaning they are uh, they rule themselves. These local churches, but they are actually. Uh, always defined by politics in the sense of when uh, they're defined by the borders of the given state. So when the borders of the state change, the borders of the church change. Uh, and it's, it's structured in many ways. So hence now conflicts with Ukraine, because it used to be part of the Russian, under uh, the Soviet Union, under the Russian Orthodox Church, but when it formed its own state, after the fall of the Soviet Union, it formed its own Orthodox Church, but some of, uh, some of it remained with that church. And so, uh, but what does this mean? It, when you cannot reach beyond the borders of the state you, and you depend, uh, you are weak because you are subordinated to whoever controls that state. You have no other point of reference. Now, formally on paper, and for some more powerful more or less, but it's, it's kind of formal, there is a first among the equals, which is the uh, ecumenical patriarch of, of Constantinople. Uh, and uh, but he does not have any authority over these autocephalous churches. So, um, so in Russia, just like in other places, um, uh, due to this uh, in inherent weakness of, of church versus state, and remember in the West there has been a huge fight between church and state in the sense of the authority, like who, who has authority over what, and, and because the state inherently wants to control everything, yeah, and, and that means also religion. He look at England and Henry VIII, who took over, uh, you know, the uh, the Catholic Church in the in that country and transformed it into the Anglican Church. Um, but in the West, they kind of agreed to uh, to, to, to sort of a, a differentiation, but with problems, of course, always. But a differentiation of the realms of uh, um, uh, authority. It took uh, centuries in which the spiritual remains autonomous to the political. And that's very important because that kind of gives you a space of freedom. Um, of course, the opposite is the uh, attempt of the spiritual to take over the political and so on. But in, uh, in Russia, uh, and not just there, uh, but in Russia specifically, um, uh, the Orthodox Church has always been subject to, to, the, to, the, to the... because it has been the Russian Orthodox Church, which means that the ruler, who was kind of usually an absolute ruler, was also kind of ruled over the, the the church because there was no other way any other place to make appeal also because there's sort of the sense of isolation of the of, of russia that that the church sort of uh, either dealt with it or reinforced and sometimes it has been uh, one of the pillars of the uh, of the regime sometimes the pillar of nationhood whatever but um what this has resulted in, and including uh, uh, also bringing in the experience of communism, meaning uh, Stalinism and the Soviet Union, is that um, when communism, right, Stalin, uh, you know, they first of all persecuted the church and then closed most churches and then took over the church. Uh, so what has happened is an emptying of, um, uh, of, uh, uh, of meaning, uh, uh, um, often um, uh, a sort of a confusion of religion with superstition, um, uh, a closeness of, of, of very uh, uh, to, uh, a closeness of, as I said, of the church to the uh, to the state as it is right now. Uh, Kirill is an 
you know, uh, um, Pope Francis had a conversation with the, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Kirill, and uh, to talk to him about, you know, the war. And he said that in an interview, uh, I think Corriere della Sera, that half of that conversation was Kirill reading to him, to Pope Francis, the head of the Catholic Church, reading to him, who called in a sense of, you know, brotherhood and, uh, you know, we're all Christians, so let's all look at this from a Christian perspective. Uh, this war is an abomination, whatever. Uh, Kirill read to the Pope Francis for 20 minutes this, the, the, like, the official political state reasons why Russia needed to go to war, which makes no sense because... I just called you to talk about, you know, the sort of the biblical perspective, like thou shalt not kill thing. And what you're telling me is like propaganda, which has is like so remote from who you are. You're supposed to stand for something different. But that comes, as I said, Kirill from, I know a little about him, but what I know, uh, well, I heard that he has been a member of the KGB, recruited something, something. In any case, the, 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 the Russian church has been marching in lockstep with Putin on the whole thing. Some individual priests have, have spoken up, but uh, you know there's repression throughout because now Russia is totalitarian. But not Kirill. Kirill has been basically backing the official line because there's no independent actual... You know, if you open the Bible and thou shalt not kill everything, this war is an abomination. Yeah, it's, it's an abomination. So... This is a complete abandonment of the actual mission of, of and the, the, the uh, what of the church there into and collapse into becoming a simple formal tool of the state, and that's kind of what he describes here. But kind of penetrates the whole thing with a sort of a superstition, and in fact the the the, the people here uh, believe uh, like when they really want to get things done, uh, they don't uh, they go to a shaman. Shaman, which is typical for this, you know, when religion collapses into superstition, you do the rituals, but then you, if you want to get things done, you go to the witch uh, or something, you know, witch doctor. And also true today because news have, you know, filtered out that um, Vladimir Putin, who might be very ill, uh, has been seeing shamans. Uh, to no surprise, to no one's surprise. While he's also going formally to attend the Eastern. Uh, East, uh, the Easter liturgy in the in the in the uh, Byzantine Church in in Moscow and so on, it's very poignantly you know, all this empty ritualism, formalism. You know, one moment he's um, the emptying of the of the of the Christian religion and transforming it into a, a sort of a pagan a pagan sort of a, a, a rituals because uh, not nothing not nothing of that of that uh, Christian. Uh, message is remains because you know one moment he makes the sign of the cross the next moment he goes to kill the uh, dissident and uh, rape his wife you know um, speaking of um, as I mentioned this uh, uh, violence and, and sexual violence and as I said there's like two moments which are very uh, explicit uh, maybe three uh, but two uh, specifically and where uh, um, Sexual, uh, sexual acts are also combined with violence. And one is sort of a ritual raping of the, of the dissident, of the enemies of the state wives. So whoever is put on the blacklist, the, the, the uh, servants are kicked out, the head of the family is executed, and the woman is ritually raped by the, by the, by the opportunists. Um, and um, as a punishment. And then there's another scene at the end uh, where it's basically a sort of an in, in internal ritual of the Aprichniks, which has, again, this sort of a, a sexual, violent, uh, aggression sort of dy dynamic uh, and meaning. And you could say, well, this is, you know, why, as I said, on the one hand, I don't like... Um, Inclusion of such things just to the for to titillate the reader because that's pornography. There's, there's no artistic meaning. Uh, on the other hand, within the grotesque, there can be a way to do this and and naturalism and grotesque to to do the satire. And I think he straddles both and he does both the, the both the good part, the artistic part, and the non-artistic part. Unfortunately, but the artistic part, the watch the one that reveals things. And here's what I want to point out: these these are realities. 
And one of the links I'm going to post and uh, here is to the Dedovchina, to, to information about the Dedovchina. And the Dedovchina is uh, the rule of the, of the fathers. I mean, again, just, just the language, the rule of the grandfathers, which is a, a practice in the army, a widespread practice, uh, kind of a hazing, but goes way beyond. It goes into raping the young soldiers, the officers raping the soldiers, beating them, but raping them and prostituting them, pimping your own soldiers to get you money. So sexual sexuality becomes a tool of violence and control. That's a reality in the Russian army, documented reality. There was a case in which a soldier took a gun and killed like eight or nine people a couple of years ago. And you would say, oh, mass shooting. No, no. It was because he was, that day, he was expected to be raped by his superiors. And he couldn't take it anymore. This is reality. And it's not like uh, just some abuse. No, no. It's, as I said, it's the rule of the grandfathers. And not all of them includes uh, rape, but uh, the, the, the behavior of some of these units in Ukraine shows the fact that they went around and intentionally tortured and raped and raped and tortured, uh, raped the woman and tortured the woman at the same time. And for what purpose? Clearly, this is not about sexuality as such, because you rape and you go on or whatever, because uh, such abuses uh, is our happen in war uh, and they are crimes but they're they're sexual crimes this is something else this is a tool of control and violence of, of punishment it's it's no longer about sexuality and and using the position of power to create do a rape yeah to rape no this is about extermination through using sex, sexuality to exterminate and there's documented cases of raping young women, girls of 10 years old, 9 year old, 12 years old, boys and men. This is what I'm saying. It's, it, 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 it's, and this is what kind of, so you're going to read it in the book. I mean, there's this instance in the book in which again, it's artistically done, but uh, it has to do with violence and sexuality as, as part of the operation, the internal rituals. But he describes something real. This is the power of this book. Again, that he sees and describes something that I was not that aware of necessarily uh, in 2006. Yeah, but it's true. It goes to some, uh, uh, you know, as I said, there's this thing practiced in the Russian military and in, in their treatment of, you know, when they go to war. Now, not all of the divisions did this. Not all the soldiers, and depends on where they come from, and whatever, whatever. But you see in their, as I, as I said, in their, their behavior, that this is this is beyond, you know, a, a sexual crime. It is a tool of um, of violence, of extermination, just like that raping of the woman of the of the enemy of the opposition. Now, these are you know like two instances in the book, and in the book that they're done artistically, in the sense of again the part of satire and the grotesque. But I wanted to point out the reality of this of this thing in uh, in um, uh, in Russia in in in, in well some of the uh, gutters of, of 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 Russian culture yeah uh, not culture but society uh, as it dysfunctional parts of it uh, but so present that this is one of the major catastrophes that we are chronicling right now in Ukraine and it comes from somewhere. So one thing we cannot do is look away, right? Because this is reality. So this is, and again, another powerful, uh, another value of this book is it doesn't let you look away. It puts you, because it's a grotesque, it's satire, it, it, it drives it through you, it puts it in front of your face, you cannot turn away. And that's the good thing, because you should not turn away, because just because you turn away doesn't mean it doesn't exist. As we see today in What's happening in Russia with its closing down, it's shutting down, it's become totalitarian and a vessel of China and all that, and, and down to this, this sexual violence. And um, okay, so it is a very powerful book. It is a very powerful book. I'm not saying it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a masterpiece of Russian literature. Uh, it is a very powerful book. It is on the, in the vein and in the tradition of a Gogo, let's say, or uh, Bulgakov, uh, Master Margarita, and others, and some you know satire writers that were you know went to 
very naturalistic, went to the depths of, uh, you know, um, there's some tra that tradition to in Russian literature. Uh, so it, 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 it nourishes itself in, in very serious literature. I think it's a very good book. I think it, and it's also, it really is prophetic and it really is powerful in how it describes some of these ongoing traits of uh, Russian society, uh, culture, political culture, um, uh, and by, uh, you know, heightening or, or thickening these, these ongoing lines, which you have to deal with. And there are other lines that are much more beautiful, as we all know, those of us who are lovers of Russian cinema or, or, or literature and whatever. But this is also the reality that we cannot and should not uh, turn away. And that can help us by pointing these things out to make sense and thus understand Russia. Okay, so that was it for today, uh, for this uh, issue, this um, uh, edition of our podcast. Um, uh, I'll see you in about two weeks uh, with the next uh, edition. Uh, please, please feel free to comment um, and uh, to share your thoughts. Uh, as I said, in the box beyond, beneath the um, uh, the video, you will you will have links to the blog, post where a link to the blog, where um, you have all these sources and resources that I have uh, talked about. Thank you.